Hello, the wonderful humans. These are some ideas that I've been cooking for a long time. Basically, the premise is that there's actually a lot of technology and it's readily available. What's missing is a new culture of learning. And I've been trying to get at like what this new culture of learning is and also how you would start to train adults to be able of like making that culture of learning happen in a school, in a university, at a co-learning center, at a micro school, wherever it is. And I think I've started to arrive at the right idea. The smallest, most atomic unit of culture that I can think of is a habit. Habits have blown up because of the Atomic Habits book and everybody trying to build healthy habits and everyone kind of gets that idea. So when I used to tell people that they needed to establish a new culture of learning, this kind of confused people. They were like, what is a culture? Well, like, well, how do you even go about doing that at a school? But I think everyone gets what habits are. So in this video, I'm with Andrew Rose and we're exploring the habits of high agency learners. These are habits that adults in learning spaces can learn to embody. Maybe there's 10 or 15 of these, I don't know yet. But once they're trained in doing these habits, they will role model high agency learning. And then the young people will be able to emulate that and then in turn become high agency themselves. We're trying to narrow them down and get to a core set of maybe 10 to 15 of them. So here's part one of that exploration. Expect an essay coming soon and maybe a part two video where we drill down on some of these. Hey, we're talking about uh, highly effective habits of high agency learners. So <laughs> uh, the, the book that we'll be publishing next summer. Okay, so I just want to jump into it. The first thing that comes to mind for me when I'm thinking about where do learning environments come from and what, what can allow us to create learning cultures and, and by the way, there, there's a frame in this conversation that, that we should just bring up first, which is that we believe, Serge and I believe, that the technology that people need to learn already exists. So all the MIT open courseware, all the YouTube videos with the explainers, all the AI tutors that you can ask about subjects, all the textbooks that people have been publishing for the last 200, 300, 400 years. Now, um, all of these things have, they exist and they are plentiful and they're all online. So clearly we no longer have a bottleneck on learning the, the bottleneck is cultural like well, well how do we actually get cultures that use these tools effectively where does it come from? the first anecdote that i think about is harry nyquist harry nyquist was a electrical engineer at bell labs do you know the story search is it no, story? Yes. so there's a quote there's a quote from the idea factory by john gertner and uh, in the idea factory he writes in the midst of shannon's career some lawyers in the patent department at Bell Labs decided to study whether there was an organizing principle that could explain why certain individuals at Bell Labs were more productive than others. They discerned only one common thread. Workers with the most patents often shared lunch or breakfast with a Bell Labs electrical engineer named Terry Nyquist. It wasn't the case that Nyquist gave them specific ideas. Rather, as one scientist, he drew people out. He got them thinking. More than anything, Nyquist asked good questions. What's interesting is that Harry Nyquist himself was not like the most productive had the most patents that everybody who ate lunch with him was the most productive and had the most patents. So I think there's an underlying principle here that's like, well, one habit of highly agentic learners is to eat lunch with Harry Nyquist. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where to take that exactly. You know, that's, um, that's yeah. I think well, it's around it. Well, let's, let's double click on that and, and zoom in on the, like, what is Harry Nyquist actually doing there? And what's the habit? And some yeah, more context is just that my belief is if we can find out what these habits are, they're the kinds of things you can train adults to do. And when the adults do these habits, I don't know, maybe it's 10 to 15 habits, then you, they set a culture in which kids can role model what high agency learning looks like, and then it can spread. So what is Harry Nyquist doing? It sounds like he's asking really good questions that draw out something from these other capable and aspiring and goal striving people. So there's definitely a habit around asking good questions. That seems a bit vague, but there's definitely a habit around scaffolding curiosity maybe is like a habit. What yeah, I also think it's, it's not just curiosity. I think it's enthusiasm. Like highly effective learners are enthusiastic about learning. And, and, and you know, we can talk about learning. We can talk about agency in general. Like patents mm -hmm. are obviously not learning. It's more like inventing. But inventors are enthusiastic about inventing. And learners are enthusiastic about learning. And I think people like Harry Nyquist, what they do is they inject enthusiasm mm -hmm. into the people around them by asking questions, by taking interest. Like, I'm sure you've had this interaction before, Serge, and, and I have it all the damn time where mm -hmm. my connection just, I need to move. 
It's a little I have this good. interaction all the time with people. Like, they will apologize for their work. Yeah. Like, the thing that they devote all their life energy into, the <laughs> thing that they, you know, the most important thing in their lives, presumably, is from, I don't know, maybe things that are even more sacred, is they, like, apologize for it because they think it's boring. I suspect that Harry Nyquist much makes people believe the opposite thing about their work. He makes them yeah. believe that the work is the most important thing they could do. He makes them believe that their work is interesting, that it has a lot of interesting questions, and he makes them think about their work more, and not just think about doing it, but think about how to publish it, how to talk about it, how to explain it. And I think that there's a similar thing in, in systems thinking that I've been thinking about recently. I, I had the chance to teach a computer science class yesterday, and I was trying to get people to understand what it's like to be a systems thinker. Yeah. So I had them all take a large piece of paper and draw some systems memory. Yeah. And the first one I started with was a bike. I had everyone a bike memory. This is a common step. If you've done this one before. Yeah. And obviously, nobody can draw a bike. If you want to figure this out as an audience member, just go look up on the internet, like drawing a bike from memory test. You know, even professional bikers who've ridden a bike every uh -huh. day in their whole lives will draw like these ridiculous contraptions that couldn't possibly actually make forward. <laughs> they'll have two, they'll have two gear chains connecting the front and the back wheel. So the front and will have to be in step and they'll, the handlebar won't be able to pivot at all. And they'll, they'll put the pedals on the front wheel, like which obviously the pedals are on the front wheel in a bike. That's not what we do. That's not how we pedal a bike. But, but you know, our, our visual memory is not good enough to help us remember how the bike works. What we need is a form of systems thinking. We need to think about, like, well, what are, all the, what are all the parts, the components of a bike, and what are the purposes? And when you connect the, all your memories of a bike with the purpose of the system, of each component in the system, it becomes very obvious what you need to do to make this bike work or to make it make sense. And I think... When a lot of people in my class failed this test, they got discouraged. Like, oh, I can't even remember how to draw. Like, such a simple thing that I've seen hundreds, thousands of times. I think when a highly effective learner fails this test, they feel excited. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, I don't even understand how a bike works. Like, okay. think about how much more I have to learn. Think about how much more I could understand about the system. Maybe, you know, and you can start asking questions draw a component and you say what's going on here what's wrong i don't know exactly what the habit is cultivates that feeling of excitement but i do think effective learners feel excited when they get things wrong and so yeah there's a lot of like there's two lenses which i'm coming at it from one is through the language of learning power which you might have read, read my article on it's this paper my 25 years of you know pretty much research on like how to what are the dimensions or characteristics of people and I think there's two components there. One is the, one is the sense making part, like seeing something in terms of systems and the interrelated concepts or the gaps in the knowledge. Like good sense making is both seeing what you do know is connected in your mind as a system and what is a gap. And then there's a second component there of like helping more hope and optimism, redrawing or gathering more hope and optimism op in the learn or yourself or the group as as people participating on the project or that, that thread of learning. So. There's, there's definitely two, at least two habits, like scaffolding hope and op optimism, helping draw out like the system of the mental model of the learner as well, through systems thinking, mind being brainstorming, whatever it is. And I, I want to like track one more thing as well. I remember what I wrote at the top of the list when I started sketching these habits, right at the top was asking other people that you're learning with or in the room with, like what's inspiring or, yeah. you know, it, there's one thing to be like hopeful and optimistic or like adverse like how does one build up their like tolerance to the failure and tolerance to the risk is that they have some deep inspiration aspiration personal mission deep curiosity but where does that deep curiosity come from often it's inspiration so like trying to draw out inspiration or like get the learner clear on what they're inspired by people objects places ideas i think that's also another habit in itself just like hey andrew what are you inspired by today like what was inspiring last week what are you finding really interesting these days is another habit. Another one I have been thinking about for a long time is debugging. Mm -hmm. Like what makes somebody a great software engineer? Like clearly it should be obvious that we should look to coders for what the best habits of learning are in this infinite domain of abstract made up concepts that you need to infinitely learn. Like literally everything in coding is made up. None of it comes from the natural world. People try their best to draw on analogies from the natural world if they want to make good explanations. But a lot of programmers do not care about making explanations. 
So you have to understand the system, even if it's poorly explained. And therefore, to be a good programmer, to be a good software engineer, however you call people that understand programming systems or code systems, you, you really just have to become obsessed with learning new things. So what makes somebody a good debugger? It's like really interesting. You, you encounter an unknown error. The error is totally obstruse. And it's like bloop, EO in like, you don't have the right magical code. And you're like, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, what are you talking about? And then you Google it on Stack Overflow. And, like, a bunch of other people have run into it, but they run it for 10 different reasons. And some are in the environment that you're in. And, and so you're like, at, at this moment, there's such a confluence of options for you to experience. And I think the good coders experience almost like a twisted enjoyment. Like, there's a little bit of a kink or something, you know? Like, yeah. the there's a twisted sense that like, ooh, like now it's on. Like I, <laughs> it's on. I get the opportunity to like show this computer who's the boss by <laughs> figuring it out from, from, mm-hmm. for myself, even though I have no help, even though nobody can get into the situation that I'm in. I'm mm-hmm. like, you're at the frontier What's alone. The- Cultivating emotions is like a complicated type of habit to talk about because it's not as obvious as like do 10 pushups a day. I do think, like, most direct way I can talk about it, though maybe there are habits that help you practice it, is that you need to be capable of transmuting, like, strong qualia. Like, you get, you get big valenced emotions in your body. And those emotions, they don't have, or you get strong, like, a big amount of emotion. In your body. And those no. emotions, they don't inherently come with a valence. And by yeah. a valence, I mean, they don't inherently come with whether or not they're bad. And it's like, you get the get the feeling and uh-huh. then you have a choice and the habit is consistently thing to interpret that feeling that you get as a form of challenge or as a form of excitement or as a form of saying like this, this i'm not gonna be down now nice. uh, and so i think that i think that's the habit. It consistently the emotion and just positive. so the, on our framework we we already kind of come into sense making we've come into belonging let's Oh, I mentioned that in a minute, hope and optimism. My, this is what we call mindful agency. It's the ability to regulate emotions in the, in the face of risk and challenge and like to know what the goal is, even though it's like risky and challenging. So in that, in that example, it's like, there is a clear goal. Like I need to get through this bug or like there's a actual end goal to the project. I'm going to regulate my emotions in such a way that it's masterful. So you say the habit, something like being really good at like regulating emotions properly so towards goals that you that you know, and if you, and the habit and the task of the habit, if you don't know what the goal is, try to figure out how to reorient yourself. So as an adult, yeah. you can say, oh, you're looking really flustered. Your emotions are really high. Do you remember what you were trying to get done and why you were trying to get it done? And they're like, oh yeah, okay, no, that's, that's a really good point. Like I should be focused there instead of like letting my emotions drag me off, come back to like why this was important. And, and now I have a plan through it with my emotions. Cool. Well, d- jamming on those other two ones that you might have seen there, there's like collaboration and belonging. Yep. One habit I know is really important is like scaffolding learning relationships around learners. I mentioned this off my um, offer board, but, but if a young person comes up to you and says, Hey, I'm really interested in rockets. You say, great. Well, there's a physicist around the corner um, and I'm going to put you in contact with them. And two of your other peers also love rockets. You should probably chat to them and talk about that video game you guys were speaking about yesterday. And then you say like, well, I also know an expert at NASA and I'm sure they'd be willing to like speak to you. So there's this sense of like scaffolding webs of relationships. So there's a long yeah. in a field crowd. This is another habit that I think is really important. Do you have any others on like that intersection of like belonging? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, think, I think highly effective learners will scaffold things like stand up for themselves. They'll scaffold Junto's, the Ed Junto, the mastermind. Mm-hmm. Like you meet up with people once a week and you discuss the hard questions and you try to unblock each other. I think just like question of other people. So like you have you have brief moments, you know, in your life and you we're all going to die. You the brief moments where you get the opportunity to probe another mind, mm-hmm. a mind that's not yours, that has learned totally different things, is totally foreign to you. And I think the habit is like find the most interesting question you can ask mind mm-hmm. because yep. those questions have like gems that un- unlock the secrets basically. Yeah. And so people are always, I think the highly effective learners are always really curious about this. If Feynman is like the classic example that people bring up where he would tinker with radios just to figure out how they worked. And he learned lock picking just so that he could play tricks on people. 
he yeah. was curious about whether or not he had a sense of smell that was as strong as the dogs. So mm-hmm. he would like, sniff around to try to figure out if he could pick up scent trails. And he found out that he could. So, you know, he, he picked up sense trail sensing via his nose really yeah. well. It's a funny one. And I, I think there is, there is a general stance here toward like curiosity toward other people, which yeah. I think develops this collaborative belonging relationship as well. Definitely. They all intersect in some way. So there's this like curiosity and scaffolding curiosity with questions and like just leading into that, that leads you to more belonging with people that you might find overlap with. And, but you said something really important there, which is actually like very on point, like kindness learners, to my mind that I've seen, are very good at building their own structures around them. And there's a habit of socially organizing or at least running events saying at this time and this place, there will be a thing and you're invited is like minimum requirement that that happens a lot. Do you know high agency people who don't do this? Yeah, yeah, I know tons of them. It's super time consuming. So I'd say like maybe like one in 10 people can actually be the host and, and other people like commit to a scene of belonging. And then they're like part of that scene. And then to the extent that they host, they like co-host or they are the first people to sign up for the event. And then, which is a form of hosting because you're like the yeah. first follower or whatever. And, and basically, I do think no matter what, the like the best most curious people in history seem always to have a scene and yeah. they always seem to be embedded in that scene mm-hmm. and to the extent that people are like the lone genius it's the exception rather than the rule and oftentimes like you would know if you if you're listening to this and you're like am i the lone genius like you know you would know mm-hmm. definitely know like first of all you have to be alone the lone <laughs> geniuses don't they can't be with other if you yeah. enjoy being with other people more than being alone, um, like people who are curious, people that are on your vibe, people that you get along with, then like you're not the lone genius archetype. And mm-hmm. then also, uh, if you are the lone genius archetype, you're probably crazy in yeah. kind of obvious way. Yeah. Isaac Newton maybe is a good example of this. Yeah. Person. And so we, we, keep, we keep pushing around these different parts of the uh, of le- of learning power. We've gone through like sense making. I'm going to try and like... Have we talked about like reading books? Yeah, let's, we can get into some yeah. of that. The t- habits, habits of highly curious people. Like you should probably be reading like, I don't know, 30 books a year. The yeah. minimum. Alan Kay once said in an interview that two books a year is the minimum. So like, <laughs> if you keep in mind, the, the people out there who are like the best leaders in the world, they're like literally hundreds of books a year. Mm-hmm. Not easy to replicate that, but also. Maybe it's not. I want to say yes to books. And I believe books are like awesome. I wonder if it's. Like there's another layer that's more fundamental than that, which is something like the habit is being highly, having a highly curated information diet. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, although, well, actually, no, actually, this is the part thing I just like one funny thing about all the one funny thing about all the like great people that I look up to is like they have they have like a totally uncurated information. It feels like they, they just learn yeah. about literally everything and whatever's in front of them and they don't try to filter it out, mm-hmm. but they also don't dwell on things. Like they don't get caught mm. information makes sense. Yes. So a, an anti-habit would be to like get caught up always reading the news. Yeah. And like that's all you read. Yeah, and, yeah don't do that. It's horrible. But also like a lot of the most successful people will read the newspaper every day. And in addition, they'll read another three books. And then they'll they'll read in every single subject. And they'll read about mm-hmm. biology. And they'll read about chemistry. And they'll read about physics. Like you, you, should, right. you should feel like you're always reading things that are at the edges of what you know. Definitely. And I think... It- well, edges of what you know is important, but I think there's something I'm sensing into, which is much more along the lines of like, you know, this strong idea that idea is loosely held or strong yeah. opinion is loosely held. It's something like where it's like, or it's, a, it's adjacent to that, where it's like, read many things, just go, go after whatever. Like if today was a day that you want to learn about firefighting procedures, like yes. read, but it's not about like being stuck on it. And I think this is a, it's, a, it's a trait of open-mindedness, yeah. which I think is the habit here. It's like a habit of, finding obscure sources, different sources, interesting sources, and then just not getting stuck in any one of them. Yeah. And then... In general, stuckness is going to be a big blocker. I mean, to yeah. any level, like, not just being a curious, like, which is just a general. You find that the successful people in history often are just like able to be unstuck, either because they have somebody looking out for them or somebody yeah. protecting them or because they themselves are super able to be flexible. So on the opposite end of that, um, from an information diet, what about publishing habits? Yeah, this is a super interesting. I basically believe that publishing is the most important habit that anybody can cultivate if mm-hmm. they want to make like intellectual progress personally. Mm-hmm. 
maybe reading, I would put like slightly ahead of it. Similarly, like cultivating very important intellectual relationships, maybe slightly ahead of it. But what's funny is that if you're publishing, it's kind of hard not to read. And if yeah. you're publishing, it's kind of hard not to develop intellectual relationships. Tweeting is like a great way to start. And then off, off of publishing and of the like off of the mind, like in the body, is there anything like habits you find? Something I find that's super important is to like actually make space to uh, to not have lots of ideas, to walk and like to to just wander and to sit in nature. Um, you find this with your walks and you go on lots of walks with your friends. Yeah, you do urban walker for sure. Physical activity is just, I mean, obviously. Right. There's a funny Visa tweet though, where like if they just try to point out all of the like all the people trying to follow all the advice to be mm. the good type of person are like distracting themselves from just hitting the target. Yeah. So there's a funny I'm reminded of here where it's like a ton of the people that I look up to in history are like live totally unglamorous and like honestly healthy and they smoke yeah like, true every day and they yeah. like work out and they die. Don't really they just get the there's stuff on you. I do think you're being early, you know. And the right thing is termination. To just some like continue doing the work regardless of you know, you're not gonna let your habits get in the way of the work. It's yeah. Kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, it's a really odd correlation there, you know, between folks who used to yeah, super unglamorous and like so often don't look after their body, but they are right on the mark in terms of their intellectual agency. Um I will I'm trying to think. Definitely not healthy, though. I don't recommend it. Yeah, exactly. The, the, yeah, the balance of you. So, if if you were going to um, write this article, this book, this teacher training, right, and you want to yes. list first the top five most important habits, uh, you list them off from what we just discussed. Like, what would be your top five? Right? Me personally, top read books in every set. Uh, attempt to read textbooks every year, like the same. But like that's a good that's a good litmus test of whether or not your reading is rigorous. You don't need to all be reading textbooks few people do that but like you attempting to read literature and then to find a group of peers that are as curious as you are and that actually drive your curiosity they ask you even more interesting questions than you ask them like that's mm. I, you should finally feel like people are outmatching you in intellect that's the goal yeah and then there i think it's this this excitement like be excited by not knowing uh like, w instead of frustrated by not knowing excited by not knowing mm. uh, there is like consistently practice regulating your emotions so that uh you just feel this excitement when you don't understand right i don't know what would you add at the last two <laughs> last two i think this like this inspiration sources is really important or at least i've i've seen it be the 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 make or break when i've met with kids is that they'll leave school and have zero inspiration sources and then you say like well like what video games do you like they're like well this one i'm like well who's the ceo of that company uh, that guy well, does that, do you like that guy? Did he make a cool company? Yeah, I guess he does. You know, so that like sparks, that shifts from like, I'm learning subjects to damn, this is really cool. Let's just do this. And I think that's, so the inspirations habit is really important. There. And then what's missing out of there, we've hit curiosity. Um, we've kind of touched on creativity, collaboration. You've talked about with like finding your squad, finding your people. Um, I think the sense making one is really important. I think like draw maps of like what you think you know of a subject. And then yeah. just like go after the game, find out what you don't. So mind map, like write, publish, like, like, like try and explicate your thinking. Uh, oh, that's, yeah, basically explain, explain systems to other people. That's right. That's the, that's yeah, one of the periods. Explain systems to other people. And that can involve publishing or it can involve conversation. Yeah. So those would be our top five. And I think there's a couple more. And then we'll weave that into a little article. So if you want to be prepared for a new publication. Andrew, you can chip in on that. And as your habits, favorite habits. Perfect. Short and sweet. Cool. Thanks for listening, guys.